Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the 2023 International E-Conference on Holocaust Studies. My name is Dr. Mehek Burza, and I'm the head of the Holocaust Studies and Religious Studies in the Global Center for Religious Research, founded and headed by Dr. Darren Slade. Keep in mind that each of these presentations are video recorded, so the information presented here will be available free of charge to you just for coming out and supporting us. So thank you for that. Now for those attending live, feel free to use the chat box to discuss with other attendees or to ask questions as they come up. Our speakers will do their best to answer your questions at the end of their presentation. You'll also be able to unmute yourself at the end so that you can directly ask the presenter questions by your own. And with that said, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speakers for this session. So we have three wonderful speakers. Dr. Rivka Rosenberg is an educational technology and foreign languages specialist who lectures at Levinsky Wingate College in Tel Aviv. Her family leads the award-winning Names Not Numbers Holocaust Initiative in schools and universities worldwide. Antonella Tiburzi is a professor of Shoah history at the University of Bolzano, Italy. She is an educator in the history of Shoah at the Department of Education and is the founder of Edu Shoah. Hadar Galrun is an award-winning British-Israeli screenwriter, playwright, actress, director, and songwriter. She is also the lecturer of dramatic writing at bar Ilan University. And they will be speaking about their play Whistle for this session. So the floor is all yours, speakers, over to you. Okay. But first, we say good morning and good night to all people in their respective areas. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Antonella? Okay, yes, I start. So good morning or good evening or good night, uh, depends of uh, where we are. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, we are very, very glad to present our our work on this uh, on this wonderful uh, piece of theater, uh, which uh, which has a very very many aspects, which are very very interesting and important for the education, for the knowledge about history, um, in a long timeline until now. Okay, as you can see, there are many, many moments of this important play, Whistle. Uh, my mother was a uh, Mengele secretary. Um, we know that uh, in every piece of theater, there are important pieces of theater, there are many, many aspects. And so we start with our, with our, okay, background. Uh, as we can see that the theater recently, but also I think in the past, uh, as a powerful um, medium for reaching uh, the student and also for reaching the curriculum uh, about history um, in our studies. And uh, it has, like in this case, like we still a very important uh, historical meaning about the history of the Holocaust. Uh, thanks to the theater, we can uh, form, we can shape a new perspective, especially for the new generation, but also for every generation. Teaching the Holocaust, using, utilizing a performing art like this of the theater, it could be very important for the for the education uh, and for the studies of about the Holocaust in performing an art. As a um, 
James Young states, which is a very important historian, the facts of the history never stand on their own, but they are always supported by the reasons for recalling such facts in the first place. I think this is a wonderful um, sentence because uh, it helps us to study, uh, but how to study this subject and uh, who, we, who are the, um, the who they go, all this study, all this is important. Uh, Youngs ask us to consider why we are doing this kind of study with our students. And uh, we are aware about the critical and the aesthetical, also re aesthetic relationship between form and contents. And I repeat, the student should consider what to teach and what to learn and who are the uh, really what to tell and indeed how to choose this subject. These are all very, very, very important, all matter. Um, there are actually uh, oh, mm, you know, the, the aim of these studies are very, very important. So the capacity of this piece of theater is uh, to engage uh, with the very, very deep subject uh, the Holocaust, and uh, this this title also we have to think that is very very important. My mother was a Mengele secretary, so we open many doors. So the study of uh, Mengele in Auschwitz and what this does didn't mean, but at the same time, um, what was the effect that this could have? on survivor. And in this special case, the secretary of, uh, of, Aus of uh, Mengele, the, that everybody called the angel of death, but actually it was uh, uh, the elite of uh, SS in the, in the na national socialism. And he chose a Jew secretary and Jewish secretary. This was a very important point also. And um, in, this, uh, in this play, we can offer really few and so on about the pedagogical activities that we can use in our classroom and how and in which, uh, in, in how and, so to, and overall what we can, we can learn for this very important story. Uh, as you can see, how this piece of theater is so important. We can see really worldwide. And uh, I hope that also soon in other places in Europe, in Italy, it could be recognized as a, as, a, as a theater, as a piece of theater which is necessary in the curriculum in the about Shoah, about the Holocaust. Just if you we see this uh, picture, we can see how symbolic is and how important is uh, this uh, only this picture. And uh, could you imagine the importance of all the piece? And uh, it is appropriate, yes, for a high school from six years old. And uh, until really adult uh, adult audience, um, yes, we can we cannot undo, of course, the the what happened in the Holocaust. But as uh, Max Mannheimer, uh, the survivor of uh, Dachau, he said that we we are not responsible for what is happening in the past, but we are responsible um, for not making this happen again. Okay, so historian can answer the question how, um, and now with the, with the technical uh, digital education, we can really reach a more wide and wider audience 
for the student. And uh, the student can answer uh, to the, about the question, but the teacher has a, the, has a, the duty to teach uh, how and what about this story. Uh, we are all agreed that we have embraced this story. We have to study it carefully. And uh, we also struggle, we're still, yes, we did. And uh, we can transform it as a, as a positive weapon uh, for uh, rise the human spirit to enlarge it. Um, we have now the responsibility about to teach and what to teach and how to teach. Uh, in order to um, help the human to understand the importance of this story, uh, for for helping also that uh, not only that happen does not to happen anymore, but also to help the new generation to understand the complexity of the history, and uh, is is a is a is a critical point is uh, to be really carefully uh, attent, uh, sensitive to what is happening until now, for example, in Israel. And this is our moral uh, duty in front of this history. Yes. So, <clears throat> about the play. Well, Whistle is kind of autobiographical. Yaakov Buchan, who is an Israeli book author who has written over 17 books, um, he came to me to help him to write a play. He said people don't read books as much as they as much as they used to read books. And he wanted to reach a larger audience and tell of his experience. And um, he came to me with many, many pages uh, of an idea of telling the experience of the second generation. And um, it wasn't yet dramatic, but I saw there the name Mengele twice. And I said to him, uh, Yaakov, you, you mentioned the name Mengele. It's not just something that you can throw there. Um, can, why, why do you use the word, the name Mengele? And I was thinking to myself, maybe one of his parents you know, was was one of Mengele's experiments because we know that he did experiments on many, on many, um, on many people. <clears throat> um, and then Jakob said to me, completely straight faced, he said to me, "My mother was Mengele's secretary," and I was like, "Oh my god!" And then that's that. That's the moment that I realized I I need to do this. I need to help him get this to the stage. And then we began meeting and he was telling me all the time his story. I said to him, then, then it needs to be about that, about your mother being Mengele's secretary. He said, no, I want it to be about the experience of the second generation. Uh, he did write, by the way, a book about his mother called, called Along the Walls. Um, it's totally about his mother's experience as the secretary of uh, Dr. Mengele. And now he, he said that the second generation... Uh, are a generation that are were born to parents who did not want them. They were born to parents who were traumatized. He said we are in we were invisible children. He even still felt like an invisible child. In fact, he wanted to write this piece to stop remaining invisible. Um, and so, um, although he does have a brother. Um, we decided that Tammy, the the hero of our of our play, would be an only child, like he was for nine years, and he was an accident. He was a child born by mistake, um, a child born out of circumstances, and his mother didn't even want him. And um, now he realizes that. Um, well, she realizes, <laughs> the character in the story, she realizes that being born to parents who were traumatized in Auschwitz, um, that who couldn't really love her as a parent would love after being 
through such a trauma for several reasons. One is because of the trauma itself, and one is also because it's too dangerous to love so much someone again because of the fear of losing them. So Tammy, Tammy finds out at quite in the middle of her life at the age of 45 that she herself has not really loved or been loved. And, you know, she's sudden, this, this realization suddenly hits her when a stranger comes into her life and is offering her something else. And she realizes this may be her last chance, her last chance to, to love as she dreams, as she knows is possible, but she never has. But for this, she needs to face the ghosts of her past um, and needs to ask permission from the ghosts to love someone else. In fact, it begins with, when, when she asks her husband, if I have someone else, would would that be okay? Would it disturb you? Even if it's not someone for all the time, not someone for... And so she's really, she's married, She uh, in the play, the character was married to um, someone who's 20 years her senior. He was a professor in university and he also kind of took her for, for granted. So we're going through an experience that is not firsthand uh, trauma, but it is what happens what happens to someone who is who is born, who is second generation and kind of gets the DNA of the trauma. It's a, a, a narrative where these are wounds that are invisible. You don't see a number on the hand. Um, there are no, on the outside, these people look like everyone else, but on the inside, they are, to be not politi politically correct, I would say, fucked up emotionally completely um so i think that because there is also so much trauma in the world even now as we're speaking not only here but in many places in the world there is horror there is war there are refugees and uh, that's what makes the um you know the the mission of the play something to everyone to some you know if you're this post-trauma continues. It continues in the DNA, in the emotional DNA, and uh, how traumas of the past actually reshape our present. How can we, how can we deal with the ghosts of our past? In order, uh, um, um, Antonella was saying before that we cannot change the past, but it depends how we tell the past in order to change the present or have a chance for the future. Um, it brings us closer to understanding the depth of what's happened. And uh, as I said, it's relevant for Jewish audiences and non-Jewish audiences um, because it, it explores how we can understand something so delicate as post-trauma, second and even third generation through a story that everyone knows, through a trauma that everyone knows. Um, it's also a story of the human spirit because in the end, we are a tribe of life and we would like to celebrate life and not to celebrate death. We would like to live to the full. We would like to love to the full. And the, this healing, this healing on a, on many levels needs to be done and it's what we try to do through the play and when i say we i mean it's me and yakov buchan the the author with whom i wrote this play and hannah vazana grunwald the director of the play who brought a very unique touch into how to make the invisible wounds visible through colors and uh, through paints that are uh, used on stage in a very delicate way and kind of bring to life what is unseen to the naked eye. Um, so individuals from all walks of life can find a connection to this, to this story on several levels. Um, it also is a bridge. It's a bridge 
that creates understanding and the common threads that bind that bind our humanity. You know, I'm I'm speaking now, but I of of the past, but I'm also speaking of the present because we have been now through a horrific trauma. We're still in a state of war, but the the trauma of the uh, the massacre that was done here in Israel on the 7th of October are things, are stories that we never heard since the Holocaust. We thought we were dealing with the past, but suddenly we find out that we're dealing also with the present. So it's a bridge, not only between the gaps of understanding, but also a bridge between past and present and a hope for a better uh, future. Um, I think that what happens when people see this play, um, because I speak on, on an eye level, you know, right to the eyes of the audience, it's a monodrama. And so it kind of doesn't have the fourth wall. And this invisible fourth wall, the, the fact that it's not there, makes the audience, um, it gives them a responsibility because I'm speaking to them. and. It kind of makes us all, it bonds us all in one, in one kind of uh, um, mission of how are we going to enable this traumatized child, woman to, to live and to love. And that becomes a mission of the audience as well, who really, really wanted to succeed. Um, it's a journey, by the way, that I think many people can relate to regardless of the back background i mean people people have this experience on different on different levels you know if you say from 0 to to 100 so maybe second generation uh, holocaust survivors have it on 100 but we all from the the small experiences in our lives or difficulties with parents um or people from violent homes they we all experience this on on kind of different levels and find that we are dealing with um, the ability to enable ourselves to live life to the full. How do we give ourselves permission to live and to love? Rifki, I'm passing the page on to yes. you. <laughs> I will, uh, as a pedagogue and uh, an educator, I came, um, I, um, went to see this play with an eye of an educator and a pedagogue and uh, thinking about how I can use this um, in the classroom. And um, I, I would like to present to you several ideas uh, today on how to really uh, look at this uh, unbelievable play um, and really use it as uh, an educational tool. So uh, many, um, Many um, people say that, you know, a theater is like a piece of art, which is for sure art and like looking at it as literature. So I was thinking of how I would actually um, go about beginning a lesson with, um, with uh, about this play. So obviously I think uh, many lessons begin with the brainstorming. So um, I would maybe brainstorm uh, with the students uh, prior to taking them to the play, maybe brainstorm in writing um, with them uh, about the, the word whistle, about the word Holocaust, where the word Holocaust comes from, uh, the word Shoah, where that comes from. And um, of course, my field is educational technology, so this can be done. Um, I'm going to just show the screen here. This can be done. Uh, for example, on um, brainstorming on a Padlet and um, something like this. So you can ask uh, what comes to your mind when you hear the word whistle uh, and Holocaust. So basically, if, uh, um, you educators, uh, uh, I think, should know about this uh, incredible tool called Padlet. And it's very basically it's a shared document and the students can go in and, you know, write uh, what I think about Holocaust. So you can say, uh, um, I don't know, someone would probably say uh, Hitler and then you write publish and then, you know, you, you can see all the students um, uh, answers. So this is one idea. Another idea is uh, called Answer Garden. 
I put the link here if you'd like uh, uh, if you'd like my presentation. It's uh, our presentation. <laughs> You're welcome to uh, to sh to uh, enjoy the links here. Uh, another tool is called Answer Garden, which uh, the students write the words. Uh, also, a brainstorming tool. But uh, once um, all the answers are shown on uh, the screen, you can actually create um, images. And that's a very, very strong uh, medium for in education. You know, you can create images with the brainstorming words that the students came up with. So you can uh, you decide which image you you'd like. So something, uh, you know, a Star of David or maybe a skeleton, uh, you can decide. And another uh, brainstorming um, idea, I thought, is really um, maybe putting a picture, something like an image like this, a picture and say, uh, think about this picture and what do you think about, how do you think this may uh, be connected to the play and then maybe coming back to it at the end of the, after they watched the, the, they attended the play or the performance and analyzing, um, you know, their thoughts before and after, which is, could be very interesting. So uh, using an image or they can draw an image. This is a, an image that the teacher can put up. You know, this is a, another uh, brainstorming idea. Um, another pedagogical idea is really identifying uh, a, a clear goal. So before incorporating theater, like a piece of literature, you, a teacher has to ask herself or himself, what, why do I want to do this? So really invite students to do uh, like a pre-writing uh, in their journals. Journals is very important in education. And uh, this can help them organize uh, their thoughts around the relevant um, open, open questions, uh, about memory, it could be about uh, what do I know about uh, Dr. Mengele? I'm sure you know the kids today uh, um, don't know much about him, so that's a it's another open question that could be interesting to, for them to uh, to research and really give the students a question that they can interpret themselves. You can use a timer; it's also um, educational and. Uh, uh, have them go home, research. You know, this is another way of us beginning the class uh, classroom. Um, now I will um, give the opportunity for Hadar to act part of the play, the beginning. So, just the beginning, just to see how it's how we how I lure the audience in. Um, Uh, so, they say people love success stories. <laughs> Even if that's true, they prefer disasters. They're other people's disasters. I mean, every half hour, the news. Why? Why? Because people have become addicted to disasters of others. Yes. Oh, I mean, take, let's take, for example, one of the biggest disasters we know of. Yeah, the Holocaust. We call it Shoah. There is no business like Shoah business. Yeah, yeah, just think of it. The Shoah in the last 50 odd years has been rolling millions. Much more than six million, I'll have you know. But <laughs> people hear and they tat and they sigh and they say, oh, this is awful. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, my goodness. But inside, they feel a kind of relief. No, no, not relief. They feel joy. Yeah, plain, simple, human, wicked joy that it's not their disaster. I mean, not your disaster. It's the disaster of some Mr. Anonymous or maybe some neighbor or maybe, maybe mine. Oh, my disaster began even before I was born. My mother, may her soul rest in peace, she told me from a very young age, who even thought that I could get pregnant after everything what I went through over there? So you must have been really happy, Mum. I was devastated. It was already the end of the war. as They took us to some camp in Austria. This is where I met your father. Both of us, we knew that we never had anyone left from, from before the war. And we stuck to each other like 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 a bandage to cover a wound. And this is how I got pregnant. Four years in Auschwitz. And I 
did not have my period. The body, it knows how to keep its blood for itself. And suddenly pregnant, I went straight to the doctor in this camp. And I said to him, I demand an abortion. And the doctor, he wasn't one of us. He looked at me and said, but Miss Helenka, every your people lost so many now in the war. And I said, so another one will make a difference? <laughs> well, he said to me, okay, okay, come next week. And next week, and next week, and next week. And this is how he pushed and pushed and postponed the abortion until it was too late to get rid of you. <laughs> yeah, well, for 45 years, no one's been able to get rid of me, but that's it now. I'm not willing to be anyone's disaster anymore. Nadav, we need to talk. I made us some coffee. Thank you. Thank you, That's Hadar. just the opening of the play. <laughs> Gives everyone a taste. So, um, listening to this part, um, I think that uh, creative inquiry is uh, appropriate for uh, teachers to do with the, with the students. And theater as um, is at, at its core an invest investigation into what it means to be human. And relevant content, of course, can often uh, uh, be incorporated, like uh, branches of history. Of course, in in uh, edu in um, Shoah education, history is uh, uh, required. Philosophy, psychology, according to this play, um, perhaps less uh, science, but the arts and cultural and culture education is uh, in meaningful ways. And many students have uh, experienced trauma, so may. Per you know, this it's very important also not just to take the students to the theater, but also to incorporate theater in, in the classroom, to have them act out. And uh, it gives them freedom um, of uh, expression and, uh, of course, develops a lifelong learning and uh, appreciation of culture. So um, Cornette is a famous um, educator who, uh, cr uh, who um, this um, researched uh, creative inquiry, and he he suggests several activities that I think are appropriate for, um, you know, wh while teaching this play. So of course, challenge is uh, what is the problem or the question presented here to students and uh, collect data, evidence, facts, uh, connected to experiment the play with words, ideas, images. I think uh, this uh, play renders itself to many images. Um, conclude with uh, insight, summarizing, synthesizing is a very uh, important skill for students. Critique. They can come and you know critique the the, the this play, saying um, what they think about it is is reflect about it, evaluate it. And uh, is it relevant? We'll talk about the relevancy soon. And basically also, of course, communication and uh, sharing with uh, colleagues and with the uh, counterparts. Um, I would like to show you now a part of uh, Whistle, uh, recording of Whistle, uh, just a few minutes. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, just one second. Yes. Okay. Um, I hope this works. Too many screens open. Just when she's asking permission from her husband. Yes. Oh, sorry about that. This was recorded in the Prague Municipal Theatre. I hope you, everyone, hears it. You need to no, it's not. You need to okay. share the sound. I'm gonna share it. Yeah, I'm gonna share it with the with the audio. I mean, with the audio. Stop sharing and share with okay. That should work. I was a good secretary. I was a damn good secretary because aiming to please is a very good trait for secretaries. For lovers, less. Huh? Is that it, Nadav? Is that what pushed you away from me? Say something, Nadav. I can't stand the apathy, the silences. Just say something. Look, if you don't want me to meet this Avram anymore, then, 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 
Then fight for me. Okay, fight for me like a man fights for his woman. Fight. Are you hearing me at all? Hello? No, nothing. Silence. And your coffee. It's cold, by the way. What should I do? Spill it out? You know why I married you, Nadav. I married you because I knew that you would never leave me. But dying is also leaving, you know. Dying is also leaving. God, I'm so pathetic. <laughs> Making coffee for a corpse. Asking permission of a dead man two and a half years under the ground to love somebody else. Why? Why am I like that? Maybe, maybe it's because the opposite of love, the opposite of death, I mean, isn't life. It must be love. Where do you think you are going? Oh, my mother. Hello, Auschwitz. I can always count on my mother the minute I get over some stumbling block and I finally know exactly what I want to appear, to tell me that I have no idea what I want and that all the decisions I ever made in my life were mistakes. Mum, it's okay. I've decided. Really, please, I don't need you here. Please go. Please, please go. Go, she says to me. As if I am the one that invited you. So at the third of the play, um, after she's been speaking to her husband all the time, asking him for permission to get to know this Avram, we suddenly realize that her husband's been dead for two years. That's the first ghost. I mean, we know that she was speaking to her mother who's dead, but then we find out that her husband is also dead. So um, I thought here that uh, would be an interesting uh, idea to integrate art. And um, you can also, of course, ask your students, uh, depending on the age, of course. These are all, all these ideas today presented are depending on their age of your students. But integrating art uh, is an important... But the students important. anyway should be not under 16, so... Right, exactly. Um, so, um, but if, uh, you know, there are university students, I don't know about uh, doing a collage, <laughs> and so but perhaps um, maybe a, a technological collage, you know, about the yeah. concepts of the character, and uh, this can even be done arts and crafts, texture, colors, or of course on the computer, you know, this is a, an important uh, um uh, collage is uh, an artistic uh, expression. And uh, another idea I, I, where we put here is really writing and creating a video or a newspaper ad about the play. So this can, of course, be in writing or uh, on, uh, on the computer or TikTok. You know, today everyone is on TikTok. So this could be an interesting uh, um, way. And... Um, I, we thought to show you another small part just to give you another last taste of the play. Um, Maybe I'll just say something about the part that we're about to see. Okay, sure, sure. Um, all, the, all the stories of the past in this play are true stories of Yaakov Buchan. They are parts of his soul that are put on stage as the story that you will see now, which is a small part of the... Also, what I said in the beginning about his mother, how she how she didn't want him and she was in a, a camp and she thought she wouldn't get pregnant. Um, th th that's completely true, as is the story that we're about to see. Um, 
of uh, how he wanted some company and uh, um you know when he was little his his mother was very much against having another child and so he wanted a pet um and uh so that that's that's the part that we're going to see now is how he finally gets the pet that he not the pet that he wants but you know compromises on If only I'd have had a, a brother or a sister. Remember how much I used to nag you? When will I have a brother or a sister? When will I have a brother or a sister? I am not making the same mistake twice. So a dog then, buy me a dog. Buy me a cat. Buy me a chick. A chick? Yes, yes, a chick, a chick, but buy me a chick, a chick, a chick, 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 like a bulldozer in my head. Hitler didn't finish me, you want to? I got him for my eighth birthday. He was yellow as the sun, soft and fluffy like a cotton ball. Nathan built her a pen. You gave the orders, and Daddy always carried them out. And he built me a beautiful pen. And you, you came with me. You came with me to buy sawdust and seeds. And I was so happy. My heart was bursting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Every day, I would come home from school, go to the balcony, open the pen, let out the chick, and do my homework, whilst the chick was running before me, to and fro, to and fro. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, you must, you must see him, he's so cute. That is cute. That is quetch. His skin and bones. Doesn't eat anything probably, only makes a mess, like you. Why did I need this in my house? Why do I need animals in my house? Only illnesses it will bring. But you need to give it porridge and bread, not this trek. Otherwise it won't survive. He will survive. I turned the chick's head towards the seeds, but he... He locked his beak. So I took the chick out of the pen with the water and the seeds, and I pushed the chick's head into the seeds. Eat! Eat, you hear me? Only those who eat survive. And then I took his head and put it into the bowl of water. Eat and drink and survive. You hear me, little chick? Only those who eat survive. Eat, drink, survive. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. And then... And then we both went to sleep. No, you stopped before the punch. <laughs> <laughs> it's on purpose. No, no, oh, okay, there was okay. another sentence there. Okay. And we... <laughs> <laughs> and in the morning, you woke me up, remember, Mummy? Clever girl, your chick is dead. I told you, what did you think it was, a toy? He died of hunger. Now, never mind. Get up, get dressed, and go and eat something. I bought you fresh rolls with cottage cheese. But eat. Eat. Those who do not eat do not survive. Now we have it. Now we nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to say a word about it? Yeah, first of all, I will speak about the color. You know, uh, Jakob Buchan himself is an artist, which is why we decided to make the heroine, uh, Tammy, an artist as well, although he's an artist that's accomplished and uh, Tammy is just like an artist at home. She hasn't had any of her works shown or exhibited. Um, 
And and uh, Hanna Vazana, Greenwald, and myself, we were thinking, well, how will it be? Will there be a canvas on the stage? Will they see what I'm painting? Uh, will they not see what I'm painting? Will it be something done ahead of time and only at the end we'll show it? And I was, I, I, I didn't know, you know, what, how, how it, how it would be, how it would look. And one morning, Hanna called me and she said to me, "Hadar, there is no canvas. You are the canvas." And the moment she said that, that's when I knew that we had a play, because there's something so powerful about bringing these invisible wounds to life through paint and that's why and I immediately said okay we'll use only black and yellow because these are the colors that we remember from the Shoah the, you know the 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 yellow star with the black and then and then the yellow suddenly and then I called I called Jacob and I said to him the story of the chick which I didn't know that at that time that it would be in the play I rem remind me the story of the chick I need to put it into the play um and um, so the, the the use of the paint is what actually um, is also something that can be used, by the way, in in the lessons in the in your uh, pedagogical five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? Ideas um, and um, how how something that is used for its use symbolizes a much deeper uh, layer of the of the consciousness which is what can be done through theater right oh sorry about that um yeah so that's why i stressed before the really the colors the images they really fit well with this uh, this play and i think teachers should use it <clears throat> sorry um, another idea that uh, we had is really having uh, the students react the character and uh, acting out is really feelings, uh, the feelings after the play and during the play and, uh, you know, the, the importance of uh, kinesthetic uh, and movement uh, in, in education is, um, is very, uh, is uh, suggested. And um, I'm, I, I, can I can I add something there, Rifki? Yes, of course, of course. Because I'm I'm a, a drama teacher and a and a teacher of dramatic writing as well in university and college. So I I would even say when you say acting out the character, I would even say um, to get the get the students to sit in in pairs and to tell each other of one um, one experience that has to do with love. One experience that has to do with love and with broken, it can be with through a pet, it can be through a boyfriend, girlfriend, it can be anything just to touch that experience, which is a very, very, you know, it's like the first experience, mm -hmm. such a, uh, an experience that we all, we all know and feel. Um, and then have, uh, if they're in couples, have the one, you know, if I was partnered, say, with Rifki, I would tell Rifki's story through myself and she tell my story and not necessarily bring them to something so holocausty but bring bring the story to them via the experience instead of having them uh, you know maybe do something that seems to them too big and too far away that's an interesting point sorry um, yeah, antonella right. sorry and also they they can talk about love and their personal experience but also love in family which is another kind of uh, love yes. Yes, in this yes, face definitely. of a whisper, this could be maybe even personal, of course, I know that, which is uh, which is too personal, but maybe can open another another case, because yes. I have met a, a lot of uh, daughters of sons of a survivor, and they, they perfectly repeat told me always the same thing that you put in the in the in the in the play in whistle the same keys key points the same uh, the same topics the same issues uh, the same thing so it is important also for the student i think that they mm -hmm. can yeah yeah parent uh, children issues yeah yeah right not only re reacting uh, the play but also really the uh, you know what what they come out with 
the ideas yeah. they come out with. And uh, another idea that I think I see we're a little bit short of time, but um, um, I'm into uh, educational technology, and I think with virtual reality, it could be interesting to uh, to put the characters uh, on trial, uh, the style of uh, Janusz Korczak. And um, I don't know if uh, um, you are uh, all, uh, whoever's watching me, uh, are aware of the plat the virtual reality platform Virbella. So it could be very interesting to use a virtual reality. It's a web-based virtual reality, and it could be an interesting platform where you can put Tammy, for example, on trial. What are your thoughts about Tammy? Uh, did she do the right thing? What is the right thing to do? And uh, what do you think about what she did? And uh, other questions like that, really putting her on trial. And um, an example for- uh, in They don't know why you're saying put her on trial though. You need to see the end of the play for that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> It just gave you a few to, uh, you know, a taste of the of the play. But uh, the idea of our presentation today is for you to bring the play to your city. And uh, that's how uh, we can really uh, use it as a in education. Um, an idea, um, if you'd like to get inspired about, uh, you know, courtroom uh, 600 is a project um, of uh, the University of Connecticut. And it's a project, basically VR project that, that uses uh, uh, the Nuremberg trials, and uh, that's an interesting also way of uh, how to create a courtroom in your classroom. Um, so we have reached uh, the end of our presentation, and uh, in order to, uh, we put here uh, several question marks, but we uh, would like to open the floor for discussion about, uh, these are examples of uh, discussion points, and uh, if you, you have any questions for us, uh, uh, you're welcome to. And uh, here are three examples that we we thought are interesting uh, to discuss. How is the play uh, relevant for the cu current war times uh, in Israel? How can the themes of the play whistle be used as an educational tool? And how can we really relate teaching the play whistle to anti-Semitism and the rise of anti-Semitism? And um, we have here a conclusion. So um, really, what we thought it, we we can't really conclude because it's uh, you know we're opening the floor to for discussion. So let's, let's, let's yeah, So let's first hear yeah. the questions. So let's first hear the the you know the discussion, yeah. the, your questions, and then we will uh, open the floor for you know uh, the rest of the presentation. Wow, that was truly engaging and fascinating, and I'm going to watch the play now. So. <clears throat> Since we have an actress here with us, <laughs> I would like to ask you that every time you perform, you just feel responsible to maintain that delicate balance between the artistic expression and simultaneously the responsibility to accurately represent a historical event. So how, how do you manage it every time and how difficult it is to balance those? Well, I, you know, I must say that um, uh, every time, every time before this play, I pray that I will be able to go into the the area of the soul of this character because she's not me. Um, and the, the areas of very, very raw, very, very raw, and very painful. Um, and it's not the kind of thing that I can fake. It's I must I must get there. I must bridge myself to to this place. Um and you know, I think that uh and, and I do have a responsibility of bringing this place and bringing this space forward, but uh, but not from not from mine, just from just from, um, you know, I know Yaakov. I met many, many, by the way, second and third generations. Whilst I was whilst I was rehearsing the play, I was writing another play for the Czech Republic called Jewish Enough for Hitler, a big play with 10 characters. And I interviewed over almost 50 uh, Czech Jews from the chief rabbi to a student who found out just like a year and a half ago that she was half Jewish. And most of them had found out very late in life 
that they were actually Jewish, but their emotional DNA was something that they felt long before they found this out. That, and, and they didn't know, they couldn't put a finger on it. And so there is something, there is something deep in the in the DNA of pain, of you know, generations of generations of being uh persecuted and running away. I myself, you know, my my father was born in Morocco, my mother was born in London after her parents fled from Poland. Um, I was born in London, but we all came to Israel. It's like there's 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 no rest. The wandering Jew is not a legend. The wandering Jew is the reality for so many of us, moving from place to place, just find trying to find to find peace. So this is something that we we hold within us, and I I uh, I need to be sincere with it. Another thing is I think that I would not have been able to touch this raw pain if I had not been through something personal myself. My um, my younger sister passed away uh, about almost seven years ago, and it was quite a short while after that that Yaakov came to me with this idea to make the play, and uh, he asked me, he is the one that asked me to act after he saw me doing a stand-up show. Um, and uh, I realized that in my in my soul had opened up places like uh, lockers of of pain that I had not touched yet, had not touched before I lost my sister. It's like with my children, lockers open up of, of joy and of love. And, you know, each time a child was born, you find yourself in a different experience of the world and of life. Um, so the same thing is also with, with this pain. And I, I would like to also say something that each play is different. Each play is different. I had last month uh, a performance in Canada and it's after the war had broken out and after all the horrible, horrifying stories we heard about children who had been murdered and parents who had been killed before their children and children and, and parents that went and uh, went back to just to, to look for their children in the in the Nova party. And and when I was telling the stories, which some of the stories in the in the play, which she's telling about, you know, Mengele. The, and I, I normally say it's a straight face. The audience were all in tears. There was one woman that was crying out loud, really crying loudly. And I had to contain myself just to not break down together with her because we weren't speaking about the Holocaust. We were speaking about the 7th of October on that, at, the, at that moment. And all the audience was in this experience. And it was, you know, it was... It was horrifying and also uh, amazing at the same time. Mm, great. And Dr. Slade, do you have any questions? Hi, beautiful performance. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. So one of the things that strikes me, and I actually asked this, I asked this last year at the conference, the same conference. And um, I think I even asked somebody yesterday or this morning, um, but I, I don't know if I'm alone in this, but it seems to be something that's not talked about very much. So forgive me if I'm, if I am um, sounding like a broken record, but what are you doing to protect your own psychological and emotional health? Um, when I was classically trained in theater, we, I, you know, I was exposed to what, what we call, um, you know, method acting. I don't know if you guys call it that, uh, and to the dangers of it. So you, we were steered away from that, uh, because it can do such psychological damage to you. Um, but what I heard when I heard you describing your method, it seems dangerous mentally for you. Um, so how are you keeping yourself sane and protected while engaging in that process? Well, actually, I think that, uh, for me, the play enables to bring out and to express 
pain in a in a um, uh, in a safe zone because the play has a beginning and an ending and it enables me to let go but to gather myself back together again so i'm i'm like if you're playing a, a game on a computer okay so you're you're the guy running inside running and, and being shot but you're also with a joystick on the outside so it kind of for me um is a is a place where i'm i can let go but i know that you know i know that there's an end i know that there's a way to come back and it's for me it's it's a it's a way of of expressing such pain which i don't usually in in everyday life so even even with the story of my sister i found out that i was letting go of a lot of pain uh it, even even a bit therapeutic um on stage um through this story and i also i'm i studied uh, theta healing i studied bioenergy um i studied aponopono and i also before i go on stage i i i do a small um short meditation of protection in which i put myself in a in a ball of light so that you know i know that it is for a certain time and you know just to be there in order to pass a message through and then i will afterwards come back to myself so that's that's my uh, spiritual way of of dealing with it and i and every time before i go on stage i say a sentence um ana eli asteoti kli lesherutcha which means please god let me be um a tool that will serve for light you know uh, so i'm 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 now just a tool i'm not hadar so interesting thank you for that um yeah i i sort of expected so, some of what i heard there um in the sense of of really not uh, not just embodying it but also kind of this outsider looking in at you embodying it I have long said this, and I'm just throwing this out there because um, maybe it'll catch on among other artists. I have been saying this for a while, you know, um, soldiers and police officers, especially if an officer is involved in a shooting, something traumatic, it's required yeah. that you have to go see a therapist. I would love to see if it isn't already happening big productions out in Hollywood and Bollywood and other places where if your role is something that is intense and you are embodying trauma, that it be expected you, that the production pays for you to be seeing a therapist as well. Um, I just- Depends who the director is, because sometimes the director can take you through uh, say safely can help you go through safely. Um, I know that in the past, directors used to do, especially directors of films, used to do awful things. They used to speak to the doctor of the actor to tell him that he's ill, so that he will be able to embody this. You know, to to trick him into thinking for three months that he's. You know, that there there are crazy stories about the things that directors did to to uh, actors on screen. On screen, in on stage, there's a really long. There's like a two month rehearsal, and you go deeper and deeper each time, just one little bit and another little bit and another little bit, until you reach these places. It's yeah. it's very different on screen. It's like you need to be there. Just you know, mm. you feel the trauma right. boom in your face. You maybe have one rehearsal before or a reading. But on on stage, it's like two months of rehearsals, and you and no director expects you to be there, even on the first week. You need to go really, really slowly into this place. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. I would argue that that's more more reason for theater actors to uh, seek therapy because it's prolonged exposure to the trauma and the build up to it. 
I'm not saying you need therapy. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, um, it, it just, yeah, I, I understand. We, and I mean, the presenter yesterday or the, or this morning, it's kind of, uh, mixing together in my brain now. This morning, uh, they, they had talked about that, uh, uh, an actor had gone and killed themselves fairly quickly after having played a role, uh, a Holocaust prisoner. Um, so while you might have great patterns and good and good coping skills, a director is a far cry from a therapist. And, and no, it's just something that I'm kind of passionate about with, we need to be protecting our actors and the performers from story. I can tell you that most um, actors need therapy anyway. <laughs> I mean, any of us who go to this, yes, <laughs> any of us who go to this, to this stage <laughs> probably need therapy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's why they're at. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> uh, but thanks for entertaining that. I appreciate it. And thanks for letting me um, share your world. Thank you very much. We just wanted to conclude with a few words, if that's okay. Um, sure, go ahead. The conclusion is um, that uh, the award-winning play Whistle can be used as a supplement to your Holocaust teaching, of course or as a primary source, depending on the planned uh, curriculum. And it enables students to view uh, history through a personal lens. And we found uh, a great example uh, of a link between connection between students and educational uh, history theater. And uh, this is, uh, if you'd like to scan this link, it's an article about uh, joining Holocaust survivors with theater class with the theater students and they produce together uh, different projects and our question to you is just a, an open question you can think about should we or should we not join Holocaust survivors with the uh, students uh, in theater it's sort of related to uh, your your question uh, Dr. D uh, Slade that uh, it's it's in it's in a, in a way it's a it's a, um, a treatment you know so instead of going it's a you know so it can be a, a way of healing. So this is our question to you: Should we or should we not join the Holocaust survivors with students in theater? Not just to go to theater, of course, to to create theater. And our conclusion is that uh, this is an excep exceptional educational resource, and we highly recommend uh, um, you know promoting this uh, whistle, the, the play whistle for uh, uh, human rights and fostering tolerance and advocating peace education very much needed to, these days. And uh, not only through viewing the play, but through really acting and performance, students can learn and evolve from a passive experience to more active one. And uh, this is a wonderful, of course, uh, learning experience. And um, here's a little uh, PR for us. <laughs> if you'd like to bring the play whistle to your city, country, museum, university, organization. Uh, I, I would just like to add one thing that, you know, now more than ever, when more and more places are stopping politically, for political reasons, stop teaching Holocaust. Um, it's very, very important. And it can be combined with a session on narratives can be combined with a session on narratives or with um, a ped, uh, ped, I'm going to get stuck with this word forever. Logical. Right. <laughs> um, educational. Educational um, session with uh, with Rifki. Um, and more hands-on because today was a yeah. lecture. So Ch changing changing narratives is a is a masterclass that I've been doing all over the world, and it's a it's it's a very powerful tool to understand and um, kind of feels that we are in a war of narratives at the moment as well. With so much disinformation and misinformation. Um, so. Yeah. On behalf of uh, my colleagues and friends, Antonella, Hadar and uh, myself, we would like to thank you, Dr. Burza and uh, Dr. Slade for inviting us uh, to present today. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much.